All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But actually, we're going to go all the way back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, uh, as we start, as we begin, I want to remind you of a verse. Uh, and, and some of this will be review because, of course, we, we took last Wednesday night and we, we, we took a week and, and, and we ministered on a completely different topic and completely different subject. Uh, but Isaiah 28 and verse 10, we, we looked at uh, in, in the previous weeks as we, as we began to answer some questions uh, in regard to gifts of the Spirit. Isaiah 28 and verse 10. 10, actually verse 9, it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? See, whom shall he teach knowledge, and to whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. The milk of the Word of God. The Bible calls the Word of God milk, bread, and meat. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In, in, in 1 Peter, uh, it says, uh, desire the sincere milk of the word, 1 Peter 2, 2, that you may grow thereby. Uh, babies always start on milk. In Hebrews chapter 5 and then into chapter 6, he says, you are those who ought to be now receiving meat, and yet you're still, you're still receiving milk. And, and that's demonstrable proof that you're not maturing in God, maturing spiritually and maturing as a Christian. And, and he said, milk are for those who, who are still infants. Uh, and and they, they, couldn't, they couldn't handle meat uh, yet. You don't put a steak in front of a six-month-old baby. And even though some people got saved 20, 30, 40 years ago, they're still six-month-old babies. That's what, that's what he said to them in the book of Hebrews. That was a 35-year-old church. And he said, you still need milk. We still have to send somebody out to find you when you're not here. You're not in your place, not here to serve, not here to, not, not, not here to worship, not here to receive. Boy, it got quiet right there. I better move over to this side over here. So, see, 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 we don't, we don't have to, you know, have somebody come around with the pacifier. With the sucky bottle, you know, be, 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 because you've gr outgrown all those things. And we look at 1 John chapter 2, if you're taking notes, just write that down. 1 John chapter 2, it talks about those who start out as children, babies, and then they go to young adulthood. Sometimes we call that adolescence or teenagers. And then they reach full maturity, full maturity. Well, this church is 35 years old. And, and I, I, I venture to say that when you see someone who's 35 years old, you don't expect them to, to uh, have to be carried around, have their diaper changed, get breakfast, dinner, and supper, you know, out of a little bottle. Maybe somebody get a little spoon. Come over here. Come over here. Just, just <laughs> going to feed you just a little bit there. Sit them in a high chair. Put a bib on them. Expect them to throw food in their hair and, you know, <laughs> stuff it in their ears and all, all that. You don't expect that out of a 35-year-old person. But these were 35-year-old Christians, 35-year-old believers, and he said, you still need milk. You still need milk. So, so we're to desire the sincere milk of the word so that we can grow. So that we can grow. Okay. Uh, and, and so he says here, whom, whom shall he teach knowledge? I'm in Isaiah 28, verse 9. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? There's a lot of people that have knowledge, but they don't have a clue when it comes to doctrine. Systematic doctrine of the Bible. Any doctrine you can name, let alone the basic seven doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ, the seventh being moving on to maturity. But those six basic doctrines that are given by, by, by name in Hebrews chapter, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, the six, go ahead and put those up on the screen, the six basic doctrines of Christ, and then we'll come back to this verse that was, there we go, uh, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And many count that as the seventh of the doctrine. Let us go on to perfection. Does that mean without flaw, that word perfection? No, that's not what it means. That word perfection means completion or maturity. 
And that's part, of, that's part of God's plan, that I start out as an infant, that I start out as a baby. I'm sorry, but you don't get a vote. Nobody seemed to care what you thought. You came into this life as an infant. No, nobody got you off to the side before you came out of the womb and said, how would you like to come out? <laughs> 16 and handsome? You know, how would you like to come out? Six foot two and buff? How, how would you, you didn't get a vote, did you? Everybody comes out a baby. Everybody comes out an infant. And nobody spiritually just, just begins and, and they're a spiritual adult. You may want to be older than you are, like most three- and four-year-olds. <laughs> right? Like most 11- and 12-year-olds. They, they want to be 16. And 16-year-olds, they want to be 21. And 21-year-olds, they want to be 34. And, 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 and 46-year-olds, they want to be 20. <laughs> but natural, naturally, you age, but that doesn't mean you mature. And everyone doesn't mature at the same rate, uh, at the same level. And spiritually, it's the same way. And spiritually, we see those who never mature. So it doesn't matter how long ago you were saved or born again, born anew. And it doesn't matter at what point you are born again. You can be in your 70s, 80s, 90s, or over 100. When you're born, you start out an infant. You start out an infant, and then you grow. Or at least that's the plan. At least that's the plan. Yep, so, so get my scriptures back up. Uh, Hebrews, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, if that would be the first. Then not laying again the foundation. These are the foundational, the six basic foundational doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first is repentance. Oh, we don't use that word anymore in the New Testament. Well, we do because it's in the Bible. Amen. Yeah, repentance from dead works. Not even repentance from sin, but repentance from dead works. Repentance from dead works. All right, what's number two? Or number three, as we count it, faith toward God. Faith toward God. Faith, not faith in yourself. Not faith in your faith. Faith toward God. All right, what's the next one? All right, baptisms, the doctrine of baptisms. And notice it's plural. Okay, uh, and laying on of hands. That's a basic doctrine of Christ. Are you kidding me? Uh, I mean, I... I never even heard of laying on of hands other than, you know, somebody needed to take you by the ear when you were a little one or by, by the nap of the neck or, or, or shake you and, and, and hopefully some sense into you. Laying on of hands. What's laying on of hands mean? What does that mean? I didn't know a thing about it. And well, it's one of the basic doctrines of Christ. Grew up in the church. Didn't know a thing about it. Laying on of hands. Just leave it up till I'm done, please. Okay, thank you. All right, what's the next one? This is an open book test. Okay, next one. Resurrection of the dead. Now see, all over the internet, all over the church world, the church world, not, not, not the heathens, not the pagans, not the godless, the church world, they're debating now whether or not there's life after death for everyone. Oh, the dead, the dead will all be raised, some to eternal life and some to eternal damnation. He will judge the living and the dead at his appearing, not some of the dead. The resurrection of all of the dead. And then the last, eternal judgment. Eternal judgment. And some translations, some translations say eternal rewards. Eternal rewards. And you're either rewarded for your unrighteousness or you're rewarded for your righteousness. Uh, and, of course, eternal rewards is one of the, uh, as we see it through the New Testament, basic doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So, so those are just the basics. Those are just the basics. That's the foundation, and everything else is built upon the foundation. All right, now let's go back to Isaiah 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. They're not babies anymore. So, so you have to go through that, get established first. Then verse 10 says, for precept must be upon... Precept must be upon... Precept must be upon feeling. Precept must be built upon emotion. Precept must be built upon... They sang my favorite song tonight, so I think I'll... Whoo! Precept must be built upon 
my good works. No, no, no. That's not, that's not the way Bible knowledge and Bible understanding come. That's not the way growth takes place. Growth takes place precept upon precept. There'll be one precept, there'll be one truth, there'll be one, one Bible, Bible fact, there'll be one element of the, the will of God, and then there'll be another one built right upon it, and another one upon that, and another one upon that. See, the Bible didn't make a mistake here when he repeats himself. He says, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line. Do you see that? He repeats them both. I think he wants us to get it. See, this is the way growth comes and development comes and maturing comes and spiritual understanding and spiritual growth and, and, and Bible knowledge. It comes precept upon precept upon precept upon precept, line upon line upon line upon line. Here a little, there a little. Here a little, there a little. Pastor, why don't I ever come to church at Living Word and get all of my questions answered? Well, that's pretty simple. That's not the way this works. That's not the way this kingdom works. That's not the will of God. That's not the will of God. You'll never go to a church service. I just want you to answer all my questions. You'll never go to a church service and get all your questions answered. You'll get a line. You'll get a precept, and it should be built on the previous precept, which builds on the previous precept, which builds on the previous precept, which builds on the previous precept, and then by the time you get your question answered, you go, oh, <laughs> and you'll have all that Bible understanding and growth and development behind you instead of just running to a church service where you think they're preaching your message and you're going to get your question answered and then go back and think you got it and no foundation underneath it, no foundation whatsoever, one brick hanging out there in midair. <laughs> Not built on anything. Totally unstable. Okay. No, the Lord doesn't want that. No. no. The, the Bible says in Isaiah 33, 6, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of your times. The stability of your times. And he wants you to be, he wants you to be, God help us be stable Christians in these days. Amen. Amen. All right. So we go back to 1 Corinthians and, and we want to, we want to get to 1 Corinthians 14 and talk about the gifts, don't we? Yeah, we, 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 we want desperately to, to study and look at and, and, and ponder the gifts of the Spirit, but we have to go back to 1 Corinthians 12 to where they're identified, and then uh, I think it's imperative for us to go all the way back to chapter 1, and chapter 1 says... Well, let's start with... Verse 3, grace be unto you and peace. Oh, no, let's go back to, oh, let's just go to verse 1. <laughs> this is a letter to a church, and it says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Not through the will of them. Through the, not through the will of him, through the will of God. Uh, and, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Now watch the rest of this verse with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. That would include Tegucigalpa, Honduras, where our missionaries are from. In every place, that would include the church that Pastor and Mrs. Robinson, sitting over here, Pastor, when they're not attending here in midweek service. Uh, that all in every place, that would include 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin. There's no time frame given here. It's just anywhere and everywhere. And, and this letter applies to anyone and everyone everywhere. This letter applies to us. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God upon always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ that in everything you are enriched in him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says to this church right here, he says to this church right here, you are lacking in none of the gifts. You come behind in no gift. You excel above every other church in the operation and functions of the gifts. There's, there's no one that you come behind. If you don't come behind anybody, you are the leader of the pack. You are in front of the race. You are leading the way. 
And, and all you have to do is read into this, into this great book and this great expose. Uh, uh, all you have to do is just read and see. They had more gifts of the Spirit in operation, and they had songs, and they had spiritual songs, and they had prophecy, and they had interpretations, and they had tongues, and they had words of knowledge, and they had words of wisdom, and they had miracles, and they had so many things, testimonies and teachings and preaching, and they had so many things. He had to establish some orderliness. Orderliness. Here's a chapter in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 14, the last verse that we look at, verse 40, is going to say, let all things be done with decency and in order. Because it was, it was just, it was a free-for-all. Any of you grow up in, in the charismatic move? Ever been to any of those free-for-alls? Man, some of you are smiling, some of you are nodding, some of you are rolling your eyes and shaking your head. Some of you even have the guts to admit, yeah, I've been to some of those. <laughs> Wildfire. I mean, crazy matic. I mean, it was a, it was no order whatsoever. Nobody in charge. Just everything. Just, just fly. And that's what was happening here. That was what happened here. Now these people didn't have the Bible to read. Those people in the 1970s and 80s here in America, they had their Bible to read. They just didn't read it. Thank God for the Word movement that emphasized the Word of God to to bring some order to 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 things. And he says he says right in there he says so that the Word of God can be taught. We're going to limit these things to three utterances, three interpretations, three prophecies, no more than three, at most, at most two or three, at most. He didn't say minimum, he said maximum, at most two or three, and then let one interpret, and then, and, and then if you've got a question, don't, don't be talking during service, ask that when you get home. He said, let all things be done decently and in order. So there's an orderliness about everything Everything of our God. Now, now let's just establish, here's one precept we can establish tonight, and then it'll be time for us to dismiss. Here's a line, here's a line, and we'll build this upon a line, and then we'll build another line upon it. Our operation of the gifts of the Spirit, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits, working of miracles, gift of special faith, gifts of healings, are any of those nine manifestations of the Spirit and or signs and wonders, signs and wonders, are any of those evidence of spiritual maturity? Spiritual maturity. See, that's what we've talked about. That's the precept that the Holy Spirit wants to share with you tonight, that His will is that you mature. Hold your place there. Turn a few pages to the right to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 is another, another of the, the uh, categories that uh, if they give me a marker, I'll, I'll happily put up here on my whiteboard. Here we go. All right. Ephesians chapter 4. And these are the offices of ministers. Ephesians chapter 4, and then we have the gifts, and, 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 and literally, they are the manifestations, and we're going to list 1 Corinthians 12, and then you have signs and wonders. And we had that in Acts 2. Hebrews 2, and also Acts chapter 5. Now here in Ephesians chapter 4, you have the fivefold ministry. Uh, and, and, and literally in the original text it was four. He says here in verse 11, and he, the he here is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gave, verse 11, and he gave some, how do we know that's Jesus? Well, it, it says so, uh, verse 7, the gift of Christ. He ascended on high, he led captivity captive, he gave gifts to men. He that ascended, what's it that he first descended in the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same that ascended up above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he, we see it there? Not the pulpit search committee. Not, not, not grandma so-and-so that said you ought to be a minister. Not you ought to be a minister because your dad's a minister. See? He gave. 
He gave some apostles, some prophets. Now, you can, you can be a minister if your dad's a minister, can't you? You can be a minister if granny says so, as long as God said so first. All right. So he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. That's literally pastor-teacher or pastor-slash-teacher. We know there's a teaching office from 1 Corinthians 12, 28. There's a separate teaching office, and we see its operation uh, in the Bible. But he gives those for what reason? Verse 13, for the perfecting. Did you ever see that word again? That we'd come to perfection. That's maturity, remember? Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, that we go on to perfection, that we go on to completion, that we go on to maturity. And so he put these gifts in the church. He did not put tongues and interpretation in the church to develop the saints. Thank you for your enthusiasm. He did not put prophecy in the church to develop the saints. He did not put working of miracles and gifts of healings in the church to develop the saints. And his will is that you go on to perfection, not go on to see the gifts operate. He wants me to mature. He wants me to develop. Gifts of the Spirit and signs and wonders are, or the fact that I stand in some office of calling, that is not evidence of spiritual maturity. Evidence of spiritual maturity are the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance. He said, they'll know you're my disciples by your love that you have one for another. Fruit is the evidence of spiritual maturity. Tongues is only the evidence that I'm filled with the Spirit. That's the initial evidence. The initial evidence. All right, so he says for the, why are these gifts given? Why are these prophets, apostles, evangelists, teachers, pastors, pastor teachers, why are they given? For the development, for the completion, and for the maturing, verse 12, Ephesians 4, 12, for the maturing of God's people to work in the ministry that the entire body be edified. Thank you for that enthusiasm. Amen. Until, now, now, now this verse, the next verse is going to tell how long they're given. It wasn't just till 2002. It wasn't until 1990 when the such and such translation of the Bible came out, so we don't need them anymore. What a bunch of hogwash. We got a new translation of the Bible, so we don't need pastors and teachers and evangelists and missionaries. We don't need prophets and apostles. And that swept through the church back in the 90s because we got a new translation of the Bible. We don't need them anymore. That person needed him more than anybody. They didn't have enough lines or enough precepts. He's going to tell you right here, he's going to tell you right here how long these gifts are going to be there until, until, verse 13, until, until we get a new translation. No, until we all come into the unity of the faith and the perfect knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect, again, next third time you've seen it tonight, unto a perfect man, a mature man. Not I've been saved a long time, but someone who has self-control, someone who's honest, someone who's full of the Spirit, so, someone who shows some attributes of spiritual maturity, Amen. someone who exercises some wisdom, someone who can handle their finances right, someone who keeps their body under, someone who puts themselves last, not I am third, last. <laughs> God is first, God is second, God is third, God is fourth, God is all. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you. Praise the Lord. I'm sure the Lord was warmed by your enthusiasm too. Amen. Till we all come to the, I mean, till we all come to the unity of the faith. I live in America. I live in 2018. We all come to the unity of the faith. We're going farther away from each other every moment, not every day. There's more schism, more division. There, 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 there's more selfishness. There's more self-centeredness. There's more greed. There's more arrogance in the church, I mean. But he says you're going to need these gifts until, 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 not 1994, until we all come into the unity of the faith unto the knowledge of the Son of God and unto a perfect man, mature, complete, fully developed, and entirely equipped for every good work, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I don't get what I want, so I leave that church and run across town and go in and go somewhere else. That's the fullness of Christ. 
He didn't get what he wanted. He went and hung on the cross and died there and bore the sin of all humanity. He said, if there's any other way for this, uh, take, do it, but, but nonetheless, your will be done, not mine. Amen. Just as far away from selfishness as you can possibly get. He submitted himself to God and to God's will and did it, yeah. no matter the cost. Yeah, till we all come to the unity of the faith, measure the knowledge of the Son of God, perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Yeah. Next verse, that we henceforth be no more children. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And carried about by every wind of doctrine. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> oh, I read this book, Pastor, and you know what I learned? Hallelujah. Somebody gave me a prophecy. I got this perfect, I got this personal word, Pastor. Oh, I wish I had two more hours. We'd go through personal words. <laughs> Carried about by every wind of doctrine and by the slight of men in cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up. May, this is the only place in my Bible I've got highlighted in red, those two words, grow up. <laughs> Into him in all things who is the head, even Christ. Even Christ. All right, enough on that line. Enough on that line. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Time for us to begin to wrap up which church here we go which church in the new testament which church in the new testament <clears throat> this is not a trick question it's kind of like the radio show you know if you listen to all three hours then they're going to ask a question at the end and and you get a coffee cup if you get the if you get the answer okay which church in the New Testament that we have record of, which church had more spiritual manifestations, more gifts of the Spirit functioning and in operation of all of the churches, which church had the most? Corinth. Thank you. Okay, we got it right. All right, you got it. <laughs> Corinth. All right, Corinth. Before this chapter is done, he's reproving them for their arrogance. Before this chapter is done, he's reproving them for their pride. Before the second chapter is done, he's talking to them about the Bible and the Word of God being totally not understandable, non-understandable and non-comprehendable to the human mind that it takes the Holy Spirit's help. And the third chapter, he starts off like this. Now, wait, 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 before we, before we dismiss, hold it. Which church had more gifts of the Spirit than any other church in the New Testament? Corinth. All right, chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual but as carnal, even as babies in Christ. Now, no, relax, come on, breathe. He's not talking to you. Hallelujah. Isn't it fun to sit back and watch somebody else get it? <laughs> I feel like a kid in school, you know. Dean of boys comes walking down the hallway, opens the door, stands in the doorway. <clears throat> Everybody goes... All the girls are already snickering. All the guys are wondering, who is it? Who is it? And then he points to somebody and goes like this, and everybody's like. <laughs> so that's the way we are right now. We look at this church in Corinth, and, and he's about ready to call them out. He said, I wish I could talk to you as spiritual, but I can't. I have to talk to you as carnal. I have to talk to you as carnal. You haven't been allowing the Holy Spirit to help you understand the Bible, so you don't. You've been arrogant and prideful 
taking glory for yourself, thinking that you were something really hot shot because you had gifts of the Spirit in, in, in function and operation. But I have to talk to you as spiritual infants, spiritual babies. I've fed you with milk and not with meat, verse 2. And, and hitherto, we're not able. You were not able to bear it. Neither are you now able because you're carnal. Wherein there is envy and strife and division. Are you not carnal and walk as mere men? Now, aren't you glad he was talking to the church at Corinth? Well, I mean, I'm not glad he was having to correct him or rebuke him or chastise him. I'm just glad it wasn't me. I get enough of that already, don't you? And I love the fact that the Lord loves me enough to correct me. Now, this isn't an indictment against you, living word. I mean, family, that, that, that's not an indictment against you, against you. That's just a Bible precept. That's just one Bible truth. Before we study all nine of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit through believers, before we go to 1 Corinthians 14 and define prophecy and the interpretation of tongues and how tongues and interpretation equal prophecy and, 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 and order, and, and, and who's the one who judges anyway? You know, what about this? I give personal words and nobody will judge my prophecy. Well, we'll, 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 we'll find out. What's prophecy for? What are the three designations of those gifts of the Spirit? And, and why is it that it seems that only one of those three categories is, is really addressed there? That's because it's in relation to the church service. That's where they primarily operate. Matter of fact, we never see them operate outside the church service in the New Testament. Those three. Okay. Are they for believers or are they for unbelievers? I mean, those are all great questions. But before we give our full undivided attention to chapter 12 or 13 or 14, maybe we ought to just remember chapter 1, 2, and 3. That here's this great church, and they have more gifts and more manifestations to the point that they're puffy about it. We got a more spiritual church than you do. Really? <laughs> really? You have a more spiritual church than we do, but you've got people fornicating amongst your church leadership. That was that church. But you've got people drunk at the communion table and gluttons. Oh, yeah, that was that, was that church. But you've got envy and strife and division, which James tells us is the open door to every evil work. Oh, yeah, that was this church. Oh, yes, you have people preaching false doctrine right from your pulpit that there is no resurrection from the dead. Oh, yeah, that was this church. They had disorderliness and chaos in their services. And the and he, he goes on to say, God is not the author of, your, of this chaos. God's not even in their services. And they're puffy because they've got a lot of gifts of the Spirit. That's the way the Bible frames the introduction to chapter 12 and 14. But if we just pop our Bible open and take up a subject and answer a question, we never receive that. We never see that. And that's not God's will. God's will for you is that you mature as a believer. God's will for you is that you get a really firm foundation and it's stable. Stability. Stability. God's will for you is that you became a Christian back in the 1970s or 80s or 60s for me, uh, and, 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 and you're still a Christian. Yes, amen. Not one of those who aren't. You're, you're, you're just a stable Christian. You're in the ministry, and, and you're not in the ministry. You're not like a firework, you know, shh, boom, wah, and then gone. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? God wants you to be like a candle. You light that thing, and it just stays lit. And he just said, that's what he said. You don't light your candle, put it, under a, put it under a basket. You just want to light everything. 
It's not as flashy and it's not as explosive and it's not as exciting as the grand finale. But when that's gone, that light's still lit. And light all night long, all through the whole darkness, all through your whole life. All through your whole life. Let's all stand. Let's, let's dismiss our, our, our time is gone. Uh, Reverend Walters and his son, JB, are going to be escorted back to the back so that you can have some moments to greet them and introduce yourself and thank them for their faithfulness and their great work on the mission field and for being our partner. You know, they don't have to let us be their partner. They, they don't have to. They, they just let us. They give us the opportunity and privilege to, to, uh, to partner together with them and help them. The ladies and gentlemen at the altar here are our prayer partners, are our prayer ministers, our altar ministry team. They're here to pray with you. If you would like someone to pray over any circumstance or situation that you may be facing, they'll join their faith together with yours. Just simply approach them. And they'll pray with you before, before you go. Now, Lord, we come to this moment of dismissal. We're not done. We're not done. We never exhaust your word. We teach here a little, there a little, precept upon precept, line upon line. Thank you for helping us tonight. Lord, I came expecting to receive, and I have. Thank you. Thank you. Might just take a moment right now and say, thank you for helping me. Thank you for helping me. All right, little Bible quiz here. Little Bible quiz. If you had your choice of any of the nine gifts, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the discerning of spirits, the gift of special faith, the working of miracles, gifts of healings, any of those nine. If you had your choice of one, if you had your choice of one, you don't. If you had your choice of one, which one would you pick? Which one would you pick? Now, you don't have to tell which one it is, but if you know which one you'd pick, raise your hand. Which one would you pick? Which one would you pick? All right, here's the better question. Why would you pick that one? Because it would benefit someone else or because you just kind of like that gift? Because every one of those gifts, they're not for you. They don't help you at all. They're all given for the benefit of someone else. They're all given for the benefit of someone else. So number one, we have no choice in the matter. Number two, they're not gifts at all. They're not given to me. They're manifestations. They only operate as the Spirit wills. Number three... They don't benefit me whatsoever, whatsoever. They're all for the benefit of another. And number four, the only proper and appropriate answer to that question is whatever gift would do the most good for others at that given moment. That's the gift I would want. That's the gift I would want. And that's what the Bible teaches. That's what the Bible teaches. Coveting earnestly the best gifts, whatever one will do the most good for the most people at that given moment. That's the best gift. Might not be the most exciting, might not be the flashiest, but it's not going to help me anyway. They're given to profit someone else. Should we teach on that in the future? That'd be a good line upon line upon line upon line. Tonight, tonight, Lord Jesus, we love you. You're our Savior. You're the one to whom all glory goes and the one from whom all blessings flow. We love you, praise you. Lift your name as we dismiss Jesus Christ, you are Lord. We dismiss in your name. Amen.